The ground shakes as something massive moves across the plain. A long neck rises from its massive body, making it visible for miles. But this creature has nothing to fear. Once, decades ago, it was near the bottom of the food chain. It outlived its siblings in the forests, and now wanders the savannah, simply too big to be threatened. Welcome to this dinosaur profile on Brachiosaurus. While most sauropods were long, low animals, this reached high to the treetops, achieving a height that had never been seen before by any animal. Brachiosaurus was known for a long time as the largest dinosaur. Although it has lost that title, it has taken over a century of finding bits and pieces to properly define this animal in its own right. So we begin, as we always do, with that story. Elmer Riggs was a paleontologist for the Field Columbian Museum of Chicago, later known as just the Field Museum. He had worked there since 1898, just five years after it opened. He was always on the lookout for new fossils to add to the museum's collection. Riggs built up a correspondence with mares in western Colorado, eager to find some large Eocene mammals. Stanton Merrill Bradbury, president of the Western Colorado Academy of Science, amateur fossil collector and dentist, wrote to Riggs, telling him that dinosaur bones had been uncovered near Grand Junction since 1885 during the Bone Wars. The Bone Wars had been effectively over since 1892, and Riggs was sceptical that there was anything to find there. Oliver Cummings Farrington, curator of geology of the museum, thought differently. He had seen how the Bone Wars had provided other museums with specimens, and wanted a large sauropod for the museum to compete. In 1899, he funded an expedition to Colorado with $500. They arrived in 1900 and rode around the area on horseback looking for specimens and promising areas to dig. Riggs' field assistant, Harold Mink, found part of a leg bone sticking out of the ground and described it as the biggest thing yet. When Riggs took a look, he recognised it to be a dinosaur bone and started a quarry, Quarry 13, but thought that it was a badly preserved Brontosaurus and decided to focus on a seemingly more promising sauropod in Quarry 12. You'll have to wait for a video on Apatosaurus for me to get into the whole Brontosaurus thing. When Riggs returned to Quarry 13, he soon realised that he was dealing with something special. Though the bone that he had found was a humerus, Riggs thought it must be a deformed femur, because it was so big. You can see here Menk lying next to his find. Riggs then found the actual femur that was the same length. He admitted later that if he had not found a giant rib, he would have considered these to be stretched and deformed Apatosaurus bones, too poorly preserved to be of value. As more bones were unearthed, it became clear that this was a new dinosaur, and it was enormous. It took days to excavate the bones and wrap them in plaster. News got around and people started to gather around the quarry, so men were employed to guard the site to stop any bones being stolen or vandalised. The bone walls were still on people's minds. The bones filled 38 crates weighing 5.7 tons. Fortunately, the railroad companies offered to transport the bones and Riggs and Menk for free as a PR move. It still took five days to get back to Chicago. When he was back at the museum, Riggs lost no time in preparing and cataloguing the bones. He knew what he had found and did not mince his words titling his description of the femur and humerus in 1901, the largest known dinosaur. He followed this up when he named it in 1903, Brachiosaurus altithorax, the largest known dinosaur. The name is Greek. Brachio meant arm, and saurus lizard, for the unusually long humerus. Altus meant deep, and thorax chest, due to the large cavity indicated by the huge ribs. At the time, Brachiosaurus presented the largest dinosaur bones in the world, so you would think that Farrington had got his wish of a show-stopping sauropod for the Field Museum. Well, only the humerus, shoulder, femur, hips, rib and some weathered vertebra were all they had. It was clearly very different to other sauropods that had been found, 
so there was no idea how to reconstruct it. In 1908, the Apatosaurus Riggs had uncovered in Quarry 12 was mounted with the disarticulated Brachiosaurus fossils in a glass case nearby. Brachiosaurus was generally recognised as the world's largest dinosaur at the time, but its appearance remained elusive, until an expedition to Africa changed that. German paleontologist Werner Janic led a fossil hunting team to German East Africa, modern day Tanzania, between 1909 and 1912. They were excavating the Tendaguru Formation, the same age as the Morrison Formation, and found a lot of fossils. In particular, a large collection of bones Janic called Skelet or Skeleton S. Janic later realised that these were two skeletons that he named S1 and S2. He took these and a collection of other brachiosaurid bones back to Germany to study. The two skeletons were mostly complete, and any gaps could be filled in by the other brachiosaur finds. Janic described the two in 1914. He seemed to have studied work from the United States, and concluded that they belonged to the Brachiosaurus genus, but were a different species, which he named B. Branchi and B. Frazi. In 1929, Janic realised that the two animals were of different ages, and that B. Frazi was just a younger B. Branchi, so the two were merged into B. Branchi. After Germany's defeat in the First World War in 1918, German East Africa was divided between Britain, Belgium and Portugal. Britain launched fossil expeditions, but never found the amounts that Yarninch had. They did find a large partial skeleton of a sauropod in 1930 that was judged as similar to Brachiosaurus, but has not been described. After over 90 years without a formal description, those working on it refer to it as the Archbishop. But work began in 2018 at the British Natural History Museum to properly categorise it. Yarninch wrote more about his Brachiosaurus. Although he had almost no field notes, he kept records of the fossils, including meticulous descriptions and drawings. The mostly complete skeletons that he had allowed him to create a complete composite of Brachiosaurus branchi, and it has since become the standard model of Brachiosaurus. Between 1939 and 1945, the various bones were transported from the Berlin Museum to different museums around Germany. Unfortunately, Allied bombs hit several, and most of the bones were lost. Janensch's record survived, and his papers in 1922, 1935, 1947, 1950, and 1961 make B. Branchi one of the best described sauropods in the world, but very few people have actually read them as they were written in High German. In 1947, Brachiosaur fossils were unearthed in Portugal. It was eventually described by the country's leading paleontologists of the time, Laperon and Zbrzewski. They tentatively named it Brachiosaurus atalaiensis, after the Atalaya area where it was found. In 1958, a French team working in eastern Algeria found another Brachiosaur, and named it Brachiosaurus nugaredi. So for a time, Brachiosaurus was riding high. B. altithorax in America, B. branchi and B. nugaredi in Africa, and B. atalaiensis in Portugal. This did not last long. Brachiosaurus nugaredi was in doubt by 1960. It turned out the French team who found the bones thought they looked like a Brachiosaurus and judged that the rocks must be Jurassic. So little was known about Algerian geology at the time. By 2004, it was confirmed that the rocks were, in fact, Cretaceous. And in 2013, that Nugaredi was a chimera of different titanosaur sauropods. Brachiosaurus atalaiensis was dubious as so much of the skeleton was missing, often just referred to as Brachiosaurus sp in the literature. In 2003, an analysis by Miguel Antunes and Octavio Mateusz named it a new genus, Lusotitan atalaiensis. B. branchi stayed in the genus for a long time. Being more complete than B. altithorax meant that it was being used to fill in most of the gaps in the original. In 1988, a piece by Gregory S. Paul highlighted some additional differences between the two species. He did not claim that they were different genera, but they were different subgenera. So, Brachiosaurus Brachiosaurus altithorax, and Brachiosaurus giraffa titan branchi. As this is the same person who Frankenstein together Dinicus and Velociraptor, while giraffa titan made the rounds on the early internet, the next notable mention in the literature was by Jack McIntosh in 1990 to say how silly it was to have subgenera for extinct animals when genera and species are difficult enough. But the seed was planted. Some began to see B. altithorax and B. branchi as more different, and in 2009, Michael Taylor carried out a full analysis and determined that they belonged to different genera. 
He ended his analysis with, Finally, I beg forgiveness from all Brachiosaur lovers that so beautiful an animal as Brachiosaurus branchi now has to be known by so inelegant a name as Giraffa Titan. But what of Brachiosaurus altithorax? Since the first bones were found in western Colorado, the next came from Potter Creek in 1959. It was a humerus that was a match for the original. In 1971 to 1975, further work at Potter Creek unearthed some more pieces of the forelimbs, definitely belonging to B. altithorax as some fossils overlapped with the original. Then there was the Ultrasaurus Supersaurus debacle of the 80s and 90s. At the Dry Mesa Quarry in Colorado, James Jensen was uncovering a large collection of very large sauropod bones in 1972. In 1979, he began talking about the two new enormous sauropods that he had found, that he named Supersaurus and Ultrasaurus. In South Korea in 1983, Kim Hang found a large piece of sauropod forearm. He thought it looked similar to Ultrasaurus, hearing a lot about it, and seemed to want in on the action. He named it Ultrasaurus tabriensis. Kim probably thought that he would give this a shot, and if his identification was wrong, he would be corrected and asked to republish with a new name. Unfortunately, while Jensen had been using the names Supersaurus and Ultrasaurus for years, he hadn't actually published those names yet. When Jensen finally published in 1985, he named Supersaurus viviani and Ultrasaurus macintoshi which caused a problem when analysis showed that it was a different genera than Ultrasaurus tabriensis, and there could not be two Ultrasaurus genera on the books. In the end, the South Korean name won out, as it had been published first. So Jensen got together with George Olszewski to make the unusual decision in 1991 of changing one letter in the name, making Ultrasaurus Macintoshi. It's weird every time I say it. Later it was revealed that Jensen had misidentified the bones and that Ultrasaurus was just more of Supersaurus. So the best thing to be said about it was that it didn't last long. There was a shoulder bone assigned to Ultrasaurus that did not match Supersaurus though. In between all of this, Jensen described a rib that had been found with a few vertebrae in Utah. The vertebrae were apparently from a Brachiosaurus, although significant work only went into the rib. In 1996, the Ultrasaurus shoulder was identified as belonging to Brachiosaurus. And in 1998, Brachiosaurus altithorax got its head. The skull in question had been found during the Bone Wars in 1883, 115 years earlier, in Garden Park, Colorado. It was broken, but the pieces were sent to Marsh and misidentified as Brontosaurus on site. Marsh was working on his model of Brontosaurus and did not question the identification and fit the Camarasaurus looking skull onto his reconstruction. Due to its broken nature, after Brontosaurus was revealed to be a Chimera, many just assumed that it was a Camarasaurus skull, until Jack McIntosh grew suspicious. McIntosh had been studying Diplodocid skulls in the 1970s, and knew that this skull was out of the ordinary, and thought it might be a Brachiosaurid. He got the attention of Ken Carpenter and Virginia Tidwell, who identified it as a Brachiosaurus in 1998. It could not unequivocally be Brachiosaurus altithorax, as there were no overlapping bones with the original, but the differences with Giraffa Titan were consistent with those differences in the body. A large vertebra was described as being found with the skull when it was dug up that might have helped, but it broke apart when it was removed from the ground. In 2000, further excavations around the dry Mesa site where Supersaurus was discovered revealed two neck vertebrae that were indistinguishable from Giraffa Titan. Again, these could not be definitively assigned to Brachiosaurus altithorax, but the shape, the size, and the lack of other candidates made it likely. In 2004, some metacarpals from a sauropod were found in Oklahoma. Originally thought to belong to Camarasaurus, their length and slender nature indicated that they were more likely a more advanced form of sauropod, and so were informally assigned to the only one in the area, Brachiosaurus altithorax. Some undescribed Brachiosaurus material had been found in Wyoming, but the 2010s had two big finds in the state. The first was a juvenile called Tony, found in 2012. Originally thought to be a diplodocid, it was found to be most likely a Brachiosaurus. Difficult to tell as most of the skeleton changed as they grew, and about 2 metres long. This little one had some growing to do. After finding the smallest Brachiosaurus, in 2018, the largest proportional piece of a Brachiosaurus was found. 
It was only the back foot, but it was very similar to Giraffe Titan. And if you scale up the rest of the body, it would have been bigger than the original Brachiosaurus. All of this brings us up to date on the material of Brachiosaurus altithorax. Before we had this, most reconstructions relied on Giraffe Titan material. The gold standard was the Giraffe Titan, then B. Branchi, skeleton that was mounted in Berlin in 1937, taken down in 1943, and remounted in 1953. Based on this, a Brachiosaurus became the first ever CGI dinosaur by appearing in the 1993 film Jurassic Park. Don't worry, I'll get into that rearing thing later. In 1994, the Field Museum did their best to mount the specimen that had been in their collection for over 90 years, but was still 80% missing. They decided to fill in the gaps with then B. Branchi material. This skeleton was set up in the Stanley Field Hall, but was moved to the O'Hare Airport to make room for the Tyrannosaurus Rex Sioux in 1999. The skeleton was only one of three made, however. The other two were outdoor versions. One stands on the northwest terrace of the museum, and the other one was sent to Disney World in Florida. Before going into Brachiosaurus, I think it would be a good idea to first compare Brachiosaurus and Giraffe Titan, since Giraffe Titan is the most complete of the two and was known as Brachiosaurus branchi for 95 years. It is important that we differentiate the two, as a lot of Brachiosaurus work is actually about Giraffe Titan. Apart from the geographical differences, the two were also separated by time. While both the Morrison and Tendaguru formations were laid down in the late Jurassic, Brachiosaurus is found in the Kimmeridgian layers and Giraffe Titan in the more recent Titholian layers. Giraffe Titan is generally more derived than Brachiosaurus, meaning that it has changed more from their common ancestor. This is best seen in the skull. Brachiosaurus is like a cross between a Giraffe Titan and a Camarasaurus, an example of a close but less derived relative. In addition to other things, Brachiosaurus has a lower crest more to the front, and while it does have a muzzle, it's not as defined as Giraffe Titans, but there is more in the main body. What spurred Gregory S. Paul to make the two more distinct was the length of the spine. Brachiosaurus had longer back vertebrae, resulting in its body being about 13% longer. This means that Giraffe Titan had a steeper slope to its back and helped it gain a bit more height. Although there is no tail of Brachiosaurus preserved, the larger muscle attachments indicate that its tail was about 20% longer and thicker than Giraffe Titan. This alone makes a Brachiosaurus longer than a Giraffe Titan of equal body size. While some have argued that Brachiosaurus' longer body and tail would have meant different neck proportions to Giraffe Titan, mostly shorter, the neck vertebrae, if they are Brachiosaurus, would indicate a similar length. The most notable difference was bulk. Brachiosaurus was heavier than Giraffe Titan. I don't like discussing dinosaur weights here as the measurements are dubious even when the paleontologist explains their methods, which they do not always do. A dinosaur's weight can change depending on the time of year, time of day, and if they have had a bowel movement when we're talking about sauropods. I have seen weight estimates for Brachiosaurus altithorax range from 20 tonnes to 44 tonnes. To put that in simpler terms, that's between 5 and 11 African elephants, a substantial margin. Going by Michael Taylor's study that differentiated the two, which used the same fully explained method for both, Giraffe Titan came out at just over 23 tons, about 6 elephants, and Brachiosaurus came out at over 28.5 tons, over 7 elephants. But Brachiosaurus altithorax, let's start as we often do with size. The first Brachiosaurus skeleton found belonged to an individual somewhere in the region of 24 metres long. The foot found in Wyoming, as described in The Real Bigfoot, was 2% larger than expected for the original Brachiosaurus, so the animal that it belonged to would have been about 2% larger. There is an issue about the original's bones. Not all of them were fully fused, indicating that it was not done growing. While we do not know how big Brachiosaurus could grow, the largest individual bone found in the Tendaguru formation, if you give it to Brachiosaurus, would make it 28 metres long. When Riggs wrote his first paper on the skeleton, before he had come up with the name Brachiosaurus, he noted how the humerus and femur were unusually the same length, and proposed a giraffe-like posture. This was later shown to have been the case, with long forearm and hand bones, and shorter lower leg bones. The giraffe posture has been incorporated into most depictions, 
including the mounted skeletons, with the neck rising from the elevated shoulders and climbing high into the air. This has drawn a lot of controversy, with some being for a fully upright neck, some advocating for a more moderate sloping neck, and even some suggesting a low near horizontal neck. Much has been made of the osteologically neutral pose, or ONP. This is how the vertebrae slot together. With Giraffatitan, an articulated neck was actually found, which, when reconstructed with the body, has a slight downward curve, but on the whole climbing. Very few animals habitually hold their necks in the ONP, and Brachiosaurus must have had a fairly flexible neck to reach the ground, what it must have been able to do to drink. There is no suggestion that Brachiosaurus had the difficulty drinking that giraffes have. What I think is a compelling argument is the stress calculation made in 2007. According to a biomechanical analysis, a horizontal posture would have had maximum stress on the neck and put most strain on the muscles. Between 75 degrees and vertical would have put least stress on the neck, but a combination of a steep climb and a gentle curve down was the optimal position for a relaxed standing, and especially travelling, pose. One argument always deployed against positions like this is that the heart would not have been able to pump enough blood up to the brain, causing Brachiosaurus to keep fainting. To keep an elevated Brachiosaurus head perfused with blood, the heart would have to generate an arterial blood pressure of over five times that of a human, and nearly two and a half times that of a giraffe, the highest blood pressure of any living animal. Specifically adapted arterial walls and other soft tissue structures would have been able to cope with this pressure, but what about generating it? Using Michael Taylor's weight estimate, a Brachiosaurus would need a one and a half ton heart, 5% of its total weight, to create this huge pressure and use over 60% of the creature's energy at rest. The 2007 study factors this in, noting that the head probably angled downward at the top to reduce stress on the heart. All of this is predicated on the assumption that Brachiosaurus had a four-chambered heart and was warm-blooded like a mammal or modern bird. A four-chambered heart is usually taken as a given, using one side to pump blood to the lungs and the other to pump blood around the body is far more efficient than the two-chambered hearts of reptiles and snakes that pump blood to both at once and is probably the minimum required for a blood system this huge and high-pressured. But what about warm versus cold-blooded? That debate has raged for decades, with sauropods being the go-to example of an animal that required the low metabolism and energy requirements of a cold-blooded animal to survive. A cold-blooded Brachiosaurus could pump blood to the head at a slower rate, and so could do it with a heart 0.5% of its body weight, or 150 kilograms. But what's it mean to be cold-blooded or warm-blooded? Normally, vertebrates fit neatly into two groups, cold-blooded animals like lizards and snakes, and warm-blooded animals like mammals and birds. But that is not the whole story. There are three aspects of these lifestyles. Now get ready, because I'm going to be throwing around a lot of scientific words. The first aspect is body temperature. Cold-blooded animals are poikilothermic. Their body temperature is the same as their environment. Warm-blooded animals, meanwhile, are homoeothermic. They can have a body temperature that is different to their environment. The second aspect is their optimum activity temperature. Cold-blooded animals are ectothermic. They cannot maintain their optimum activity temperature and generally achieve it during certain times of the day. Warm-blooded animals are endothermic. They can maintain their own optimum activity temperature constantly. The final aspect is metabolic rate, how fast a body uses energy to grow and keep active. Cold-blooded animals are Brady metabolic. They have a low metabolic rate. They grow slowly and usually can only be active for short periods of time. Warm-blooded animals are tachymetabolic. They have a high metabolic rate. They grow fast and can remain active for far longer. That is the general status of things, but life does not always fit into neat little boxes. Large Nile crocodiles are definitely cold-blooded. They are bradymetabolic and ectothermic. But the adults are so large that their bodies retain heat during the night, so they are effectively homoeothermic. A Brachiosaurus tens of times the mass would have been the same regardless of anything else. As for maintaining optimal activity temperature, 
This would have been easy to maintain with so much bulk. But about metabolism. It need not be a strict one or the other. By slowing the metabolic rate to 50% that of a mammal, and therefore decreasing the energy requirements, Brachiosaurus could produce the necessary pressure with a heart one-fifth the size of a fully tacky metabolic animal, about 300 kilograms. Admittedly, still very large. As I said, Brachiosaurus' size allowed it to be homoeothermic and endothermic, its immense body maintaining a core temperature regardless of the environmental changes, and that heat retention keeping it at an optimal temperature. But what if it got too hot? I noted in my Diplodocus video that early on some scientists thought that sauropods were too big to be terrestrial, thinking that they must have been aquatic waders. Riggs stated in his 1904 paper on Brachiosaurus that all of its anatomy point to it being a terrestrial animal. Despite this, through the early 20th century, there were many depictions of Brachiosaurus and other sauropods as waders, with Brachiosaurus using its high nostril openings as a snorkel. I'll come back to this nostril thing later. In the 1950s, opinions started to shift, and it was calculated that water deep enough to submerge a sauropod would have put the body under so much pressure it could not breathe. But in 1990, the idea that sauropods would bathe to cool themselves off began to get some traction. There are two things that would allow sauropods to lose excess heat without the need for a dip. Elephants lose their excess heat through their ears. The ears increase the surface area with little increase in the volume, allowing heat to escape. Sauropods did not have external ears, but they had huge necks and tails. Lots of extra surface area and not much extra volume. The necks and tails could have acted like radiators to lose excess heat. That is external means of heat loss, but sauropods also had internal means. The vertebrae of adult sauropods were almost completely hollowed out by air sacs. On average, the volume of sauropod vertebrae was about 61% air. These air sacs could have acted as a cooling mechanism, allowing heat to pass from the blood and tissues into these sacs. It's not known whether these air sacs in the bones were connected to the respiratory system or not, but even if they were not, the heat could have been lost by passing it onto the air as it passed out of the neck. The presence of air sacs also explains how sauropods with such long necks were able to breathe. A mammal would not last long with a neck like this, as the trachea, or windpipe, would have so much dead air inside it, little would reach the lungs. An air sac system, like those of birds, don't have to worry about a long trachea. A whooping swan has no trouble with a trachea that winds through its body. A magpie goose is perfectly fine with a trachea that loops around like this. And a trumpet bird can go around with a trachea like this. Something as simple as a long neck is a breeze. This is due to the makeup of bird-like lungs. Instead of having gas exchange occur between every inhale and exhale, sauropods would have inhaled into rear air sacs. These would then work like bellows, pumping air through the lungs and drawn into the front air sacs. This spent air would then be exhaled. This meant the air would constantly be moving through the lungs. There is also a difference in how oxygen is passed into the blood. In mammals, air is drawn into the alveoli, and gas exchange occurs with blood vessels that are around them. Birds do things differently. The air is fed through tubes in the lungs, and is surrounded by a web of blood vessels that, importantly, flow in the opposite direction to the air. This means that even though the oxygen is being taken from the air, the oxygen in the blood is always lower, so oxygen is being passed into the blood along the whole length of the lungs. The difference in these systems is stark. A mammal can expect 55% of its blood to be saturated with oxygen. A bird has 80% of its blood saturated. Brachiosaurus's lungs would have provided a high concentration of oxygen at a constant rate. But what about its food? Brachiosaurus had a huge gut, like other sauropods, which would let the poor nutrient vegetation ferment and stew with the help of symbiotic bacteria. For a long time it has been considered that sauropods used gastroliths, swallowed stones, to grind up the plant food to break it up and allow for easier digestion. This idea has come under scrutiny for a few years now. Not all sauropod skeletons are found with stones around the gut, and those that are are different from gastroliths found in modern birds like ostriches and even some ostrich-like manoraptiform dinosaurs. 
The stones are often too polished and too rounded to be from a gastric mill type gut. In some cases, there is a large number of gastroliths found, and these are probably just pebbles that have been deposited. But occasionally, there do seem to be pebbles that a sauropod has swallowed. Was this by accident, or were they doing it deliberately? There are some animals that ingest minerals to supplement their herbivorous diet. By swallowing calcitic pebbles, like limestone, that would dissolve in stomach acid, the sauropods may have been getting minerals that they were unable to get from their food. An elephant has to spend 80% of its waking time foraging, one of the reasons why scientists used to argue that a warm-blooded metabolism was too much for sauropods. But elephants spend most of that chewing. Brachiosaurus had no interest in that. Brachiosaurus had a long, wide jaw containing 56 to 58 chisel-like teeth, more than Camarasaurus or Giraffatitan, with several developing in the jaw. These teeth were, again, primitive compared to Giraffatitan, with simple cutting edges. Brachiosaurus would have closed its mouth on anything that took its fancy, cutting it away with its teeth, and swallowing the mouthful whole. It could not chew, it just let the material stew in its gut. So Brachiosaurus should eat a lot faster than an elephant, and it had a longer digestive tract to extract more nutrients from what it did eat. Make no mistake that this fermentation would have made sauropods far smellier than any modern mammalian herbivore too. Brachiosaurus was far from the only sauropod in the Morrison Formation. This environment had a huge amount of megafauna, Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, Camarasaurus, to name just a few. All of these seemed to eat different types of food to avoid competition. Diplodocus and Apatosaurus were low browsers, using their teeth to strip leaves. Camarasaurus was a medium to high browser, snipping off leafy branches. Brachiosaurus took the high treetops. Brachiosaurus' long forelegs meant that the base of its neck was already about 5 metres off the ground. Its neck, when fully raised, could add 8 metres onto that, enabling a feeding height of over 13 metres, about level with a 5th storey window. This is based off a Brachiosaurus that still had some growing to do. Research has shown that animals like Diplodocus and Barosaurus could rear up to feed from trees. This would not compete with Brachiosaurus because these Diplodocids could still only strip leaves, but also could not reach the heights of Brachiosaurus. And speaking of rearing, while it is technically possible, it would have given Brachiosaurus a limited boost when it was already the tallest around, and would have been supremely dangerous. It would have been top-heavy, and could easily fall. If that happened, it would come down hard. Its head would have been the worst. Imagine dropping a watermelon from the sixth-story window. 17 metres is a long way to fall. Sticking with a Diplodocus comparison, both have the same number of neck vertebrae. 10. Diplodocus shifted 4 of its back vertebrae into its neck, while Brachiosaurus only shifted 3. Brachiosaurus still had the longer neck, because each of its vertebrae were longer. Each vertebra also had cervical ribs, these long spokes of bone pointing down the neck. These were delicate, and not found on the poorly preserved Brachiosaurus neck vertebrae, but on Giraffatitan vertebrae. These would have had ligament attachments, connecting them to strong muscles around the base of the neck and shoulders. They also limited manoeuvrability. Brachiosaurus and other sauropods could not bend and weave their necks like swans and ostriches. They had a wide feeding envelope, but did have to move their body to feed inside it. For example, if a Brachiosaurus wanted to feed off a lower branch of a tree, it would have to move back, then lower its neck. It could not just snake down. Of course, it would probably feed low and then raise its neck up as it moved closer. The muscles being close to the base lightened the neck, and the feeding method helped. Having strong jaws for chewing would have made the head very heavy, one reason why long necks are rarer in mammals than birds. Despite this lightening of the load, Brachiosaurus's head had complex senses. It had very large eyes, which almost filled its eye sockets, giving it good eyesight and low light vision enabling it to forage during dawn and dusk. It seemed to have hearing as good as a human, even better for low sounds. Elephants communicate over long distances through infrasound, sound that is too low for the human ear, and seismic waves generated by stomping being felt through the ground. Brachiosaurus had a large enough chest to have produced phenomenal infrasound. And seismic waves? Definitely. In addition to hearing, they also had a good sense of smell, although where it smelled from is disputed. 
Many have taken it for granted that because the nasal openings were in the high crest, then that was where the nostrils were. Some have used this crest as evidence that Brachiosaurus had a trunk of some kind. While Camarasaurus and Diplodocus had too small a facial nerve for a proboscis, the opening in Giraffe Titan is large enough for it to be possible. This does not mean that it did have one and wear on the teeth indicates that it did not. A 2001 study noted that there are five points that the nostril had been proposed to be. It argued for the front of the skull, noting the groove in the snout and that fleshy nostrils could have formed. It argued that almost all living tetrapods had their nostrils at the front of their nasal openings, and those that did not had it in front of their nasal openings. This would have left a large area in the crest for scent detection, giving Brachiosaurus a great sense of smell. Some still argue that the nostrils were on the top of the head to allow the animal to breathe while dipping its head to drink. All of this information would have been fed to the brain. Despite the humour derived from the idea of an animal weighing as much as seven elephants having a brain that could fit into your hand, sauropods weren't really as dumb as they are portrayed. Most sauropods have brains that, in comparison to their body size, would put them on the intellectual level of many reptiles, and they seem to get along fine. A giraffe titan's skull had a brain case preserved, which shows that Brachiosaurus had a brain volume of 300 millilitres, or about half a pint, and weighing about the same as a grapefruit. While this is extremely small for birds, it is within the expected range of modern reptiles for animals that size. From this, it is assumed that Brachiosaurus was perfectly able to look after itself, although might have lacked behavioural flexibility, or adapting well to new situations, even with the dense neurons of a bird brain. But this is not good enough for some people. I only learned this when doing research for Brachiosaurus, but Stegosaurus is not the only dinosaur that has been accused of having a second brain in its hip. For those who have not watched my Stegosaurus video, there is no evidence of any vertebrate having a second brain anywhere. Spaces in the hips are found in modern birds, and they do not contain a second brain, but a glycogen body. The precise function of these is unknown, but they are probably for energy regulation. Brachiosaurus did not need much smarts, and it had enough to get by. One of the reasons Brachiosaurus was unusual for sauropods was how front-heavy it was. Most sauropods had most of the weight over the hips, using their hind legs for locomotion and bearing most of the weight. The forelegs propped up the front and added stability when the creature was walking. Brachiosaurus was different in that most of its considerable weight was held by its forelegs. The front feet of Brachiosaurus were different from the splayed digits of more primitive sauropods. The metacarpal bones were arranged in a horseshoe shape for strength, and the fingers were greatly reduced, although later titanosaurs will get rid of the finger bones altogether. They still had a polex, a claw on the hand, but this was very small, almost vestigial. The fingers were not individual, they were all covered by flesh and scales to make one weight-bearing foot. A footprint in deep mud in Portugal has a clear impression of a brachiosaurid front foot, possibly a looser titan. The marks on the print show that the dinosaur brought its foot straight down and then lifted it straight up before stepping forward. Most animals use their forelegs or all of their legs to move. Sauropods propelled their bodies using their back legs with the help of their tails. Huge muscles in the tail connected to the hind legs contracting would pull the legs back shunting the animal forward. Using the tail allowed a lot of muscle to drive the legs. While we have plenty of sauropod tracks, there is disagreement on how fast sauropods could move. Evidence from tracks consistently show a speed of less than 4.5 miles per hour, often less than 2 miles per hour. But these are huge animals, often walking on slippery mud or soft sand. You can't expect them to be at their top speed. Computer models have suggested that on firm ground, they might have been able to reach 12.5 miles per hour. A study on elephants of different sizes actually showed a consistent top speed of almost 22 miles per hour. While the larger elephants had longer legs, the smaller elephants had a faster pace. Estimating the top speed of gigantic animals is tricky. Another thing that is tricky to work out is herding behaviour. Generally, when you find a mass of tracks or several animals buried together, you assume some sort of group. In the latter, I have noted in my Platysaurus, Allosaurus, and Dionychus videos that this is not always the case. With Brachiosaurids, a herd is likely, due to footprints and evidence from other sauropods, all of which probably formed some kind of herd. 
There is a lot of variation whether these herds were age segregated or not. That is, herds of animals of similar age. This difference is complicated. A study by Myers and Fiorillo in 2009 goes over this really well. You can easily tell an unsegregated herd. You have a group of footprints or body fossils of different sizes and, presumed in footprints, ages. For evidence of segregated herds, absence of these groupings is not enough. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. If you have a group of body fossils of similar age and size together, a lot has to be done to suppose that they travelled together exclusively. There may have been some event that killed older or younger members of a mixed group. Even a mixed group could have died, and depositing currents carried younger members off, leaving the old, or brought younger members to one place. With body fossils, showing evidence of an age-segregated group has a high bar. It's easier for footprints. Here you would have footprints of similar size, but not only large. A mixed herd could pass an area and the heavier members leave footprints while the lighter ones leave no preservable trace. This situation caused some to speculate that sauropods could run on their hind legs. A trace of only the hind feet were found at a site in Colorado. They were made on land so the animal was not swimming, and they were clearly juvenile sauropod tracks. Later this running theory was disproved. I told you that sauropods tended to be back heavy. Well, sedimentological analysis showed that the hind feet carrying most of the weight left impressions, but the front feet did not have the necessary weight. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So, the best evidence for an age-segregated herd is a track of multiple animals of smaller size with no large prints. For Brachiosaurus, there is really no evidence. For Giraffa Titan, there were several different ages found geographically close. This is far from definitive, as they may have died centuries apart in time, or be brought together by drought or something. As I said, fossil evidence on this is weak. We do have some print evidence from Portugal of Brachiosaurids, possibly Lusotitan, of seven subadult individuals walking together with no adults. Far from definitive, but Brachiosaurids probably travelled in age-segregated herds. Age segregation might have helped in feeding, as all members of the herd had similar feeding envelopes and could eat together. It also might have been a good thing for Brachiosaurus around mating season. It's difficult to tell, but there are some indications that Brachiosaurus reached sexual maturity early, when they had reached 40% their full size. It certainly would be difficult, if not dangerous, with a mate two and a half times heavier than you. Some depictions of Brachiosaurus in recent years have added colour and quills as display, or even more elaborate structures, taking inspiration from some birds. These sorts of things I am dubious about. Other large animals do not put energy and resources into pure display structures. Things like elephant tusks or rhinoceros horns have several functions, of which display is only one. Brachiosaurus had to put everything into growing, and growing fast as we shall see. Also, an animal as big as Brachiosaurus would be noticeable enough without display paraphernalia. Having seemingly small herds, Brachiosaurus probably had some method of genetic exchange between groups to prevent interbreeding. This may have been like elephants with wandering males and herds of females, or even sexual segregation with male herds and female herds. Whatever method was used, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to tell which. Brachiosaurus has only been found in the older layers of the Morrison Formation, 154 to 153 million years ago. It was an outlier there, and probably a rare sight. Its diet of high trees caused herds to seemingly migrate all over looking for food, as fossils are found spread across the formation. In total, 12 possible Brachiosaurus have been found in North America. This is the same number as Haplocanthosaurus, an enigmatic sauropod, and less than the 13 confirmed Barosaurus finds. Next in the megafauna population is Diplodocus, with 98, although some might be Barosaurus bones. Then there is Apatosaurus with 112 specimens, with all the old Brontosaurus finds folded in. And topping the population is Camarasaurus, with a whopping 179. This is what they look like as a pie chart, showing that high-feeding Brachiosaurus was a minority. It appears that in Africa and Europe, the Brachiosaurids, Giraffatitan and Lusotitan were more numerous because of different vegetation conditions, more tall trees. In fact, some have speculated that Giraffatitan even had high browsing competitors, like the find of the Archbishop. 
but the Morrison formation was mainly fern savanna, causing Brachiosaurus herds to wander to feed. When feeding, they had no competition from other sauropods. Brachiosaurus could get at food the other sauropods could not hope to reach. Camarasaurus, the mid-level browser, ate similar hard woody material, but could not feed much higher than Brachiosaurus's shoulder. When they reached full size, they were also safe from the fern savannas' predators, Allosaurus and the possible Allosaurus, Saurophaganax. Tempting though a Brachiosaurus might have been, a full-grown adult was dangerous. A tap could break bones, being stepped on would be devastating, and inflicting enough damage on a healthy behemoth like that would be difficult. Flesh grazing, feeding from non-fatal bites, is possible, but again dangerous in a herd of giants that could easily crush you. A full-grown, healthy Brachiosaurus was near untouchable, but they had to start somewhere. No sauropod eggs from the Morrison formation have been found. In fact, all sauropod eggs are titanosaur eggs from the Cretaceous. Although sauropodomorph eggs from the Jurassic show that all sauropod eggs were similar, Brachiosaurus eggs might have been very similar to those of titanosaurs, as they were closely related. The eggs were either buried with vegetation or laid in open pits. As the eggs would take 65 to 82 days to hatch, the latter strategy would involve some level of parental care. Due to the segregated herds and the range of travel of Brachiosaurus, I think that burying was most likely. The eggs would have been laid in small clutches of no more than 10, covered with some plant matter and then left to their fate. Sauropods could apparently do this several times a season, producing multiple clutches throughout the year. If we imagine a herd of 7 females, that would create an absolute maximum of 70 baby sauropods from one herd. This would not create a predator satiation situation, like turtles or horseshoe crabs, laying so many eggs that the predators that come for them cannot eat them all. But the young might have formed a kind of herd of their own for protection. Not defence, I want to make that clear. Brachiosaurus had no spikes, no armour, no defences whatsoever. The protection would be statistical. If you are part of a large group and one is killed, that one is less likely to be you. These babies had to grow, and grow fast. At birth, each would weigh about 4 kilograms. They had to grow over 7,000 times that in a few short decades. It's hard to know the age of sauropods, and therefore how quickly they grew. Normally, we would cut through the thigh bone and count and measure the rings. Sauropods don't have rings. They grew so fast they did not let up, which creates the rings that we see. Also, any rings of mature growth are often obliterated by secondary bone growth in sauropods. It's possible that at the height of their growth spurt, they were putting on half a ton to two tons a year. Tony, the possible juvenile Brachiosaurus, is interesting in many ways. As I said, it's impossible to know how old Tony was, but no more than a few years old, and already two metres tall. The legs are almost the same height as each other, and the neck is relatively short, meaning that the front legs and neck grew faster than the rest of the body, starting off low to the ground and eating higher and higher food as they grew. The bones of Tony are also poorly pneumatised compared to adults. This means they had less invasion of the bones by air sacs. If air sacs were a means of getting rid of excess heat, this could have been a way for young Brachiosaurus to avoid getting too cold, as fossil skin found with eggs showed that even young sauropods had no fluff or feathery covering to keep themselves warm. The forests would have been convenient places for young Brachiosaurus to live. There was plenty of food and hiding places for when they were small, but they were also teeming with predators. Driven from the savannah by Allosaurus, a myriad of theropods lived in the forests. Dinosaurs like Ornithelestes, Saurus, and Stoxosaurus would have dined happily on young sauropods. Larger predators like Tanicalagrius and Marshosaurus would also have fed on young Brachiosaurus larger than Tony. Brachiosaurus had to grow fast. If Brachiosaurus ventured out on the savannah when they were 40% their maximum size and sexually mature, they would still be in the forests, but off the menu of these small carnivores. But they would draw the eye of the larger predators, Ceratosaurus and Torvosaurus. These two had to make do in the forests, unable to challenge the dominance of Allosaurus on the savannah. But juvenile sauropods would make a good meal for these large theropods. Eventually, what remained of the brood would emerge from the forests and join other sauropods and ornithischians on the savannah. Nanosaurus... Gargoyleosaurus, Dryosaurus, Camptosaurus, and Stegosaurus. The brood might form a herd of their own, or join up with other herds of similar age. 
When a large Brachiosaurus died, it would provide food for weeks. An adult sauropod carcass could support a whole ecosystem of predators, scavengers, larva, microorganisms, the works. As Brachiosaurus grew larger, it grew more protected against predators. So fully grown Brachiosaurus were probably only killed by old age and disease. Looking at other sauropods, it might have reached the largest size that we know of in its late 20s or 30s, and could have grown larger if it lived to its 50s. It might have been possible to see lone Brachiosaurus, individuals that outlived their herd, but faced no threat from the Allosaurus that stalked other sauropods. Once called the largest known, Brachiosaurus has since been eclipsed as our knowledge of dinosaurs has expanded. But Brachiosaurus remains a true giant. It reached high, using its neck in an unusual direction for sauropods, but one which is very familiar to us now. It challenged the notions of dinosaurs when it was discovered, and still provokes passions in paleontologists and the public today. Thank you for watching and all of your support. As usual, do all the YouTube things, like, subscribe, share this with anyone you know interested in dinosaurs. This is far from my job, so click the bell to be informed of the next time I put one of these videos out. And keep leaving comments about what dinosaurs you'd like to see. I have a few on the docket, but let me know what to add. There's a lot of love for Carcharodontosaurs and Abelisaurs I've noticed. If you want to further support this channel, I have a book available on iBooks. It's interactive, has original illustrations, and including Brachiosaurus, shows some of the other dinosaurs coming up. Link along with some of my sources in the description. Next, seemingly commonplace, one of the dinosaurs that could be said to have started it all. A dinosaur profile on Iguanodon. Hope to see you then.